Hey guys, this is John, and I'm back for another U.S. Chess League game analysis. This is a game I played on board two of the Minnesota Blizzard versus St. Louis Archbishops matchup. And my opponent is international master Priya Darshan Knappen. He's a college student in the St. Louis area uh, from India. And he's a strong IM. I believe he has two Grandmaster Norms. And in his first season in the U.S. Chess League, he racked up a ridiculous number of wins. I think he went something like 9 out of 10 or 9.5 out of 10. So he is a top performer in this league historically. And this is the third time we've played. We've played over the board twice before. And I had a score of 1.5 out of 2, one win and a draw leading up to this matchup. And uh, I knew him to be a tricky opponent. He's a great practical player, and he applies a lot of pressure not only on the board, but on the clock. He tends to have a, a keen sense of time, I've found. And at various points in this game, he was making uh, good and quick decisions and putting me under pressure uh, on, the, on the clock. So let's get rolling. I played d4. I have white yet again. You might have noticed that I have white in all of these games so far in the U.S. Chess League. And as I mentioned before, the managers are free to choose their lineups. And I'm not playing every single week for the Blizzard. So I happen to fall on weeks where I end up getting white, <laughs> which I'm not going to complain about. Everyone likes to uh, be white in a chess game. So I open with d4. And previously, Kanapin has played knight f6 and also d5 on move one against me. But this time he played e6, mixing it up a bit. I played c4. If white wanted to, they could play e4 offering to go into a French defense after d5, but I kept it in d-pawn territory. And Knappen played f5, so entering a Dutch. So this was a surprise. Uh, I think I saw one game where Knappen did this, but I was not really expecting this opening. So I played g3. It's good for white to fiend kettle the light square bishop against the Dutch. You notice black has not established a pawn on d5, so the bishop coming to g2 and operating down this diagonal could be of great help to white. Compare it to sending it to a square like d3, where it's going to be hitting against a pawn on f5, it's more effective on the long diagonal. So g3, black plays knight f6, I play bishop g2, and here Knappen plays d5. So this is a prelude to the Stonewall Dutch, wherein black sets up a bunch of their pawns on light squares. So they'll have a chain of light square pawns stretching from b7 all the way over to f5, because they're going to play c7 to c6 on the next move. And this is a stodgy defense for black. They are putting a lot of faith in their uh, light square complex, and it leads to strategically rich games. So here against d5, I played a move that looks odd, but in fact is a move order nuance that white can employ against this move order. So I played knight h3. And I know what you're thinking, that looks like a beginner move, moving the knight to the edge of the board. But in fact, there's a specific reason behind it. And if I back up for a moment, there are a lot of Stonewall Dutch players who actually think for this reason, the fact that white has that knight h3 move available, that it's more accurate for black to play c6 first and only d5 thereafter. That way, if white were to play knight h3, black could refrain from putting the pawn on d5 and play d6 instead and possibly retain the option of going e5. Because one of the white uh, ideas is to put the knight on f4. And if there's the possibility of e5, once the knight gets to f4, it probably won't be feeling too comfortable there. So I knew this idea to be possible, the knight h3 idea, that is, after black has committed to d5, so I went for it. And I have some experience in this line. I played a standard game against a player named Dare Dare uh, several months ago. And I was kind of trying to remember that game and, the, and this one against Kanapin. So my opponent played c6. I played queen c2, defending the pawn on c4. It's also possible simply to castle. I looked up the game against Dare Dare afterwards, and that's what I did against that player. So queen c2. The queen usually comes to c2 anyways, and it's helpful in order to defend the c4 pawn. It's doubtful that black would actually take on c4, but it's still nice to have that protection. So black plays bishop d6. And I played bishop f4. So in the Dutch Stonewall, because black has put all these pawns on light squares, that very clearly defines which bishop is good and which bishop is bad for them. This light square bishop is a bad piece for black. It's blocked in by their pawns. 
Sometimes it manages to activate itself via B7 or even with a maneuver like this, but it takes a lot of effort for black to make that bishop relevant, whereas the dark square bishop is a great piece for black. It fits in nicely between the c6 and the e6 pawns, and it's in white's best interest to try to trade that piece. So this is one of the primary ideas of knight h3 is that it assists in playing bishop f4, offering a trade for that bishop on d6. And should black take, I would be uh, more than willing to take back with my knight and establish this on this nice central square. It looks at the e6 pawn from here especially, and it might even play knight to d3 to e5. So after bishop f4, black castled. I could take on d6 right now, but after queen takes d6, even though I've achieved my goal of trading the dark square bishops, I feel like black will be able to complete their development without too many issues. They'll probably play uh, like b6, bishop b7, knight bd7, and then possibly look for pawn breaks in the center, maybe c5 or e5. And that queen feels comfortable on d6. It's hard for me to kick it away. I could play c5 to chase it, but um, the effect of c5 is that there's not quite enough pressure on black center. And often, as is the case in the game, after c5 is played, I'll have to think about black counterattacking with e5 later. So that's why I didn't trade right away. Uh, I just castled instead. And now Knappen plays a interesting move. So they play, he played bishop e7, dropping the bishop back and just avoiding a future trade. So with bishop e7, I think black is really playing against that knight on h3. So by refraining from a trade, I can't easily get my knight to the square that my bishop is on. And g5 is not an optimal square either. I'd probably just be looking at getting chased away with h6. So black reasons that it's worth a tempo to avoid the trade of bishops and maybe make the knight on h3 look kind of weird. So I played knight d2, simply developing. Black played knight h5, chasing my dark square bishop. And I felt like if I moved this bishop, I would be losing time. So I just played knight f3, allowing black to take it, after which I finally get my knight to the intended square. So knight takes f4. So black now has the bishop pair, but I have a big lead in development. And also I feel like I have good control over the center, especially that e5 square for now. Also black can't so easily develop because you notice a move like knight d7 would run into knight takes e6 with a fork. So black has a couple minor issues to solve. Uh, here they played bishop d6. So Knappen just places the bishop on its ideal square now that there's no dark square bishop to worry about. I played knight d3. So now I've got both knights pointing at this e5 square. Also this knight as is often the case in a Dutch, can assist in a queenside pawn push. So it's kind of a multi-purpose piece. It takes aim at the center, but it also might allow me to push my pawns and provide backup for that. So black played knight d7. And here I did follow through and play b4. So expanding on this wing. Black played queen e7, attacking the pawn. And here, I found two games that actually reached this position. So afterwards, when I looked in my database, I saw that white in those games played rook a, b1, which defends the b pawn and also prepares to play b5. I saw this move in the game, but I didn't like the fact that black can play b5 and try to shut down the b pawn's advance. And here, white has a choice between c takes b5 or advancing c5. But during the game, I wasn't really satisfied with either. Uh, having analyzed this now, I think c5 might give white a slim advantage. One of the games that I looked up went bishop c7, a4, so attacking b5. This was Martinovich versus Kulyasevich from 2009. And black played bishop a6, defending b5. White advanced a5. And here black struck on the king side with g5. And the position strikes me as pretty complex. As I said earlier, the Dutch can produce some strategically rich positions. I think I like white here a bit. This bishop on a6 looks misplaced for certain. Uh, but needless to say, this would lead to a, a pretty intriguing game. I think any result is possible from a position like this. So it's possible rook a b1 is better than what I did. But in the game, I just wasn't happy about that b5 response shutting down b5 from white. 
So hence I played c5, grabbing some space and doing it with tempo. Black moves the bishop back to c7. Now, because I don't have pressure on d5, I now have to concern myself with black potentially advancing e5 and trying to break through. Black would love to achieve that advance because this is a backward pawn right now. And in playing e5, they have the support of these three pieces, dark square bishop, knight, and queen. And also this light square bishop might become liberated down this diagonal. So with my next move, which was queen b2, I'm trying to discourage e5. And I'm also placing my queen on a square that will help in pushing the b pawn. So I'm also looking to play b5. Black played rook e8. So what can happen is renewing the threat of e5. And because of that, I have to go into blockade mode. I don't think I can justify allowing black to play e5. Uh, the computer actually said I should just play e3 and allow them to do this. But I really think black gets sufficient play should this happen. And if we count the attackers and defenders, they're exactly even. Uh, four attackers, four defenders. So black can get away with this move without losing anything. And it just seems like the landscape of the position after several trades like this isn't something that black has to be too concerned about. Maybe my bishop is arguably a bit better than black's because not, my bishop is not impeded by any light square pawns, but it's, it's really slim at best. So therefore, I uh, decided to stop black from playing e5, so I jumped one of my knights into that square. So knight f e5, offering to trade on e5, but playing to blockade that e6 pawn. So black took on e5. And here, originally I was intending to take with my knight. So I was intending this move. But there was a line that scared me off, and it was bishop takes e5, d takes e5, and now the move a5. And I disliked this because I thought my pawn on c5 would become vulnerable. Notice that I can't play b5 because of queen takes c5. So I know once again, black's bishop is kind of entombed for the moment, but their position is solid enough where uh, they're not going to run afoul of any uh, tactic or anything. So they can afford to play a move like a5 and kind of strike at my pawn structure, which is rather fragile. The computer thinks I might have a small edge after a3, but... I really don't see it. Black can play bishop d7, and once again, I'm kind of splitting hairs here. I think black has every reason to be satisfied with this position. So for that reason, after knight takes e5, I spent a little time, and I ended up playing d takes e5, so keeping the knight on d3. Now if black were to play a5, my knight is assisting in defending c5, so I can push past with b5 without fear of losing that pawn. But even here, um, this didn't happen in the game, but even here, I think maybe c takes b5, queen takes b5, and then rook b8 intending bishop d7, trying to chase away the queen from b5, could give black good play. So all in all, I'm not really sure I have much at this point. Uh, I think white is a tiny bit better, but that could easily disappear. My advantage could dissipate if I don't follow it up correctly or if black plays accurately over the next several moves. So Knappen just played bishop d7 though, so for the moment he doesn't touch the queenside pawns. I play a4. So when I played b4 way back when, this is one of my intended follow-ups. I want to pawn storm black on the queen side. Black played b6. So this is a timely move. Black's showing that they're not going to entirely let my let me have my own way on the queen side. They're attempting to strike back at my pawns as well. And since it's clear that the queen side is going to be the theater of battle, it makes sense for both sides to bring their pieces over to that side of the board. You can see that the center is pretty blocked up. I've got my pawn on e5, black has a pawn on e6. Um, maybe I could somehow prepare f3 and e4, but in this position, it's kind of a pipe dream. That does happen a lot in the Dutch Stonewall though. King side, nothing much is really happening. So the queen side is really where all the action is going to take place. So after b6, I just brought my rook over, rook f to c1. I want to get my heavy guns in place to assist on this wing. And black does the same, so they play uh, rook e to b8. And now black's rook on b8 is x-raying my queen on b2. I had a bit of a think here as well, and time becomes a persistent problem for me in this game, as we'll soon see. Uh, 
the, there are several candidate moves for white at this point. I thought about taking on b6. I thought about advancing b5. That was a strong candidate I have for a while. And I also thought about just moving the queen away. So playing a move like queen d2 or as I played in the game, queen d4. Just trying to get away from the rook's gaze down the b-file. So in, at this moment, uh, I wanted to run you through this variation with b5, which I thought about in the game because this is kind of interesting. So after b5, there's all this pawn tension, right? There's like two possible captures black has, b takes c5 and c takes b5. And if they take with the c pawn, I would have been happy because c6 can be played, attacking that bishop. And then after this bishop moves, like say bishop c8, a takes b5, and white has a protected pass pawn very deep in black's position, and black's pieces look pretty bottled up. Not good for him. The issue, though, is that instead of c takes b5, uh, b takes c5 can be played. And here I was looking at a line, knight takes c5, c takes b5, and now knight a6, so looking to fork the rook and the bishop. But if you'd like to, you can pause your video now and try to come up with a good reply for black to knight a6. So what should black do in this position? Okay, so here, black can favorably sacrifice their rook on b8 by playing b takes a4. So opening up the attack on the queen, and I don't have time to take the bishop on c7, so white is obligated to play knight takes b8. But after rook takes b8, black is not even down any material. They have a bishop plus two pawns for the rook, and they've got this strong a pawn and a dark square bishop that is going to be a huge bother for white. It's attacking e5. It may find a good home on b6. It could assist in the a pawn advance. I don't like this one bit for white. I don't think my rooks are doing a whole lot. I think anybody would love to play black here. So that's a line that I looked at and I probably spent a little bit too long on. In a game, especially a, a longer game, sometimes you feel like you have so much time and you'll look at a particular line and you almost get like tunnel vision. You'll lock into that line and you'll try to force it to work. And that's what I was doing with b5. And if you catch yourself doing that, you have to have the presence of mind to tear yourself away from that. Uh, it sounds obvious, but the sooner you can tear yourself away from a tunnel vision line, the better. And I spent a little bit too long on this, trying to make this line work. It just doesn't work after b takes c5. So eventually I played queen d4, and black played a5 now. So now we've got some serious pawn action going on on the queen side. So black is attacking the b4 and the c5 pawn. And I decided to create even more pawn tension by playing b5. So advancing. Now this whole time, it looks kind of weird that I would be willing to play so aggressively on this wing. In view of black's bishops, that should theoretically favor black if the position opens up. But the thing is, I think if I slow down, I'm not really going to have many chances for play. Uh, I felt like opening the position and try to utilize, trying to utilize my space advantage was the best thing to do because I wasn't sure where else I was going to play, to be honest. I mean, the queen side is where all the action's taking place, and if I stop going forward over there, black could easily overtake me and um, possibly be better. So after a5, I played b5, and there's, again, two possible captures black has. But instead of capturing either pawn, they just played bishop to d8. So Knappen retreats his bishop and keeps the tension. So this is something that you see in games between high-rated players sometimes, is when there appears to be a lot of pawn tension, one side or both sides will just kind of ignore it for a little while. And I mentioned that it happens in high-rated players' games because I hardly ever see it in lower-rated players' games. You know, if this situation were to occur in a game between your average, let's say, 1,500 players, I bet there'd be a lot of pawn chopping going on. And both sides would be so concerned about getting rid of the pawns because that's what you do when you can take something, right? You, you go ahead and capture. But in doing so, you might be 
giving up some sort of advantage if you're too quick to capture. So Kanapin is recognizing here that it's not favorable to take either pawn. And let's check why. So if c takes b5, we already established that the move c6 can be dangerous for black, attacking the bishop. And after that bishop moves, a takes b5. This is pretty similar to the, the previous line, where white gets a, an entrenched c pawn very deep in black's position. So that's no good. Uh, also, if b takes c5, I can take with my queen, attacking black's queen. And should they capture my queen, I get to go knight takes c5, attacking the bishop on d7, that pawn on e6. And that bishop's kind of overloaded because it's having to defend c6 and e6 at the same time. So going back here, Knappen senses that neither capture is good. It's better to wait and kind of see how things shake out. So he plays bishop d8. And I too wasn't thrilled about capturing at the moment. Um, I did play b takes c6, but I kind of think I maybe even could have waited a bit longer because... Again, c takes b5 is not a threat. I can always play c6 after that. But I played b takes c6. They took it to bishop. And I, I sort of felt like my queenside play was coming to a dead end. You know, if I continue chopping, like b c takes b6 now, they're going to take with the bishop. All of a sudden, this dark square bishop has scope. My queen is under attack, so I don't have time to grab the bishop on c6. And black could be getting the play he wants on that wing. So for that reason... I decided to look for play elsewhere after b takes c6, bishop takes c6. And if you'd like to, you can try to pause your video and look for a way to white for white to generate play on a different area of the board. Okay, so here I played g4. Unusual move. So uh, advancing on the king side all of a sudden, neither of us have that many pieces over there. But because black was so massed on the queen side, I felt like it would be good for me to seek other avenues of counterplay. And g4 seemed like a good, good move to play, so trying to weaken the defense of f5. If black does nothing and allows me to take on f5, then this e-pawn will be deflected and d5 will be weak. So... Knappen reinforced that pawn with g6. We got a trade on f5. And all of a sudden, this g file is open. And both kings are a bit exposed. I thought black's king was a little more exposed than mine, since I do have a bishop on g2. So here I sidestep with my king, king h1, possibly indicating that I want to play rook g1 and go after his king along the file. So it makes sense what he did. He played king h8. And now I took on b6. Maybe I could have kept this tension a bit longer once again, but um, I was actually slightly worried that black might play b5 if I waited too long, trying to knock out my a pawn and obtain a passed a pawn themselves. So I took, black took with the bishop attacking my queen. I fled to f4. Also because black's g pawn is gone, they can't play g5. So that was another reason why I played g4 a couple moves ago. Here black played bishop d7, so retreating the bishop from attack. I played rook a b1. This is the only piece I haven't moved yet. And it is doing a good job of helping to defend the a4 pawn. So is my queen laterally along the fourth rank. But I felt like this was a good time to, to play this move. Um, I figured if I played something like rook g1 and just went outright for an attack, black can always swing their rook over to g8 and oppose me. So I didn't feel like it was quite the right time to start attacking on the king side yet. It's just another option. So I played rook a b1. And here there was a little trap that I was hoping for. I was getting a bit lower on time at this point. So um, I was looking for opportunities for play. And in playing rook a b1, I set Knappen a bit of a trap, which he avoided. So he played bishop a7, but... A move that could be tried for black is bishop d8, looking to swap down the b file. That bishop probably doesn't want to stand on b6 forever with white's rook on b1 attacking it, so bishop d8 or bishop a7 makes sense. So if bishop d8 is played, try to find a tactical solution for white. Uh, I have a little idea here. 
And if you want to pause your video and see if you can find it, you can do so now. Okay, so white can play rook takes b8, rook takes b8, and now bishop takes d5. So my bishop that's been sitting on g2 since basically the beginning of the game and has usually just been kind of blocked by black's pawn on d5 suddenly springs into the game. And the point is that after e takes d5, white has this line opening move, e6. So opening up the attack on the rook on b8, which is undefended, and also that bishop on d7. And this would be a great way for white to transform the position. And I come out on top. So a line that I looked at with the computer afterwards was rook c8. And then this move queen e5 check. Trying to entice black's king over to the g file so I can play rook g1. And then it would pretty much force black to play queen g7. Queen swap. Rook check. Take on d7. Now white's up a pawn. Black will get that d-pawn back, but here white has rook to g8, attacking the bishop. Rook takes d7, and now check. And according to the engine, the best thing for black to do is just give up the uh, pawn on f5, after which white has a clear extra pawn in the endgame and decent winning chances. You can kind of see why, because if the king steps to e6 or g6, they're going to run into a fork. Knight c5 or knight e5, fork on the king and the rook. So that's kind of a computer line, but I did see um, the implications of bishop d8, and I was ready to trade rooks and then play bishop takes d5, and I knew that this would lead to a favorable position for me after e6, regaining the material. So Knappen instead played bishop a7, and here I played bishop f3. So clearing the g file, maybe looking to bring the rook over there, with a unimpeded file to work down. Interestingly, it was actually still possible to play this move, rook takes b8. And this is a line that um, only a computer would go down, I think. This line starting with rook takes b8, rook takes b8, and now bishop takes d5 once again. Now, I didn't even think about this because I just assumed that after e takes d5, e6, this wouldn't work for white because the rook on b8 is guarded this time. Remember in that other line, the bishop was on d8. However, the engine shows this kind of crazy line. Queen takes e6, and now knight c5, forking the queen and the bishop. And black cannot play bishop takes c5 because the rook on b8 would hang. And the engine line continues. It goes queen f7, knight takes d d7, queen takes d7, and now rook c7, so forking the queen and the bishop. Very difficult continuation to see from far out. And I think even if I had much more time than I had in the game, I'd be unlikely to find this. This is pretty tough. And I would be surprised if Knappen saw this too. Um, <laughs> this rook takes b8, rook takes b8, bishop takes d5 working even in this position. And it doesn't win for white or anything, but it does lead to some advantage. And um, yeah, I mean, if I knew that this was good, I, I certainly would have gone for it. So... I played bishop f3 instead. Knappen took on b1, so we traded a pair of rooks. And then he proposes another trade of rooks. Here I maybe should have kept this pair of rooks on the board. I think rook c1 would have been a decent option, just avoiding the trade. But I was getting low on time, and I decided simply to swap and then play my queen over to d4. So I was kind of wary that when these rooks come off the board that my pawn on a4 has potential to be very weak in the endgame. You can see black's light square bishop is already lined up against that pawn. So I wanted to create counterplay and try to distract black from winning it. You know, if they get another move, like maybe they'll try queen a3 and try to combine a double attack on a4. So queen d4 was an effort to try to transfer the queen to b6 and harass that bishop. And it also takes away bishop a7 for now. And as I mentioned here, um, I was very low on time for the rest of the game. And my opponent had about 10 or 15 minutes left around here. And he made good use of it. He put a lot of pressure on me down the stretch. There was a 30-second increment after each move. So we do get 30 seconds added. But you'd be surprised how fast 30 seconds can get eaten up in a tournament game. I mean, many of you guys have seen me play Bullet. And 
you know, <laughs> I can play an entire game in 30 seconds sometimes in bullet, but OTB is a different matter entirely when you're up against a strong opponent and the quality of the moves is so much higher. Like your, your 30 seconds can get eaten up like that real fast. So black plays bishop e8. I played queen b2. Uh, I think I thought about invading on b6 as well, but I decided queen b2 might be a, a better way to attack that piece. And then bishop a7. Here I played queen c3, attacking the pawn on a5. Bishop b6. And I really wanted to avoid a scenario like queen a1, where my queen is being forced to guard that pawn. You never want your queen defending a lowly pawn if you can avoid it. So for that reason, I played a more active move, queen to c8. So pinning that bishop on e8. Can happen played queen d7, offering a queen trade. Trade would be pretty bad for me, because once again, that pawn on a4 is totally lonely after a queen trade. And if I try to defend it with a move like knight b2, well, black's bishop pair is really going to make itself felt. I guess they could take on f2, but even, even a move like bishop d4, attacking this and this, and trying to force the knight away from guarding a4, this would be bad for me too. So I got to keep the queens on. I got to try to create counterplay and not allow black to get into an uh, endgame with the two bishops, especially if my a pawn's dropping off. So here I played queen b8. I think it actually would have been better to go all the way back with queen to c1. Point being there, if queen takes a4, I have this nice move, queen h6. And suddenly black is in trouble because I'm threatening queen f8 mate, and I'm also threatening the pawn on e6. I think the computer said black was just losing here. So queen c1 would indirectly defend the a4 pawn. But instead I played queen to b8, so still looking to pin the bishop, and also I'm threatening the bishop on b6. Knappen plays bishop a7. I think queen d8 might have been a better move, insisting on a queen trade. But bishop a7, here I played queen a8. And black plays king g7. It makes sense that black wants to escape the pin on the e8 bishop. If I get a chance, I would play bishop h5, and I'd be attacking the bishop twice. So king g7. And I now played a move that is tempting, but is probably not best. So I played the move knight f4. I think it would have been better simply to play e3, blocking that dark square bishop. I discussed before in my videos how a good method in playing against a bishop, especially a strong bishop, is to establish two connected pawns on the same diagonal as that bishop. And I think that would have been a good idea here to do that. But I couldn't resist knight f4. You know, usually when you're in time pressure, you're going to uh, tend towards more active moves rather than kind of positional moves, I found. So with knight f4, I'm trying to attack e6, and also I'm looking at maybe utilizing the h5 square. Can happen played bishop takes f2, which I saw. Now here, I went down to maybe five seconds or so on my clock. Remember, you get the 30 seconds added, so even if I go down to five seconds, I'll still have 35 seconds after I make the move. But I thought for a very long time, because the move I was trying to make work was bishop h5 in this position, attacking that bishop on e8. And I like the look of uh, something like bishop takes h5, knight takes h5 check. And I thought my queen and my knight had serious potential to coordinate against black's king. However, after king h6, knight f6, black has this move queen to g7, threatening mate on g1, which turns the tables. And my queen is so far away, it can't assist in uh, the mate threat very well, and guarding against the mate threat. The only way to do it is queen to g8. But after queen takes g8, knight takes g8, king g5, I think this endgame is hopeless for white because I've got so many pawn weaknesses. Black's king is active. My knight is... Often, uh, <laughs> nowhere land, <laughs> never, never land on g8. And I doubt that white can hold this position. Uh, a line that I was actually afraid of in the game is part of the reason I didn't go for bishop h5 is I couldn't quite figure out what happens if, if queen takes a4, attacking the knight on f4 and also threatening back rank checks. And I was looking at the line knight takes e6 check, 
king h6, queen takes e8. And I got kind of spooked by the possibility of queen d1 followed by queen to g1. But in fact, after king g2, queen g1 check, king f3, uh, black has nothing. Their queen has no good checks to play. If queen h1, I can just take the bishop and I, I should be able to kind of dance away from their remaining checks. And I am up a piece after all. So another thing you do in time pressure is you start seeing ghosts oftentimes. And um, you'll be so paranoid and wrapped up about preventing counterplay from the opponent that you might reject like active looking continuations because you can't calculate everything and there might be an element of danger and you just don't want to take the risk when you have no time to figure it out. So all in all, I'm glad I didn't go for bishop h5, but I didn't go for it for the wrong reasons. Uh, bishop h5 is uh, not dangerous in view of queen takes a4. As I thought in the game, it's dangerous in view of bishop takes h5, knight takes h5, king h6 and this queen g7 idea. So after bishop takes f2, I just took on a5. I knew I wanted to get rid of this a pawn. I think that kind of helps defensively. Uh, then I only have to worry about black's pawns in the center and on the king side. So queen takes a5 is kind of a nice move to play in that regard. Black played bishop e3. Note that queen takes a4 would hang the pawn on e6 with check. So that's not a great option for black. So after this, bishop to e3 attacking my knight on f4. I played queen b4 defending it. Bishop f7. Here I played a5. Now black played a good move, so Knappen played queen c7, attacking e5 and also looking to bring the queen down to c1. This sort of obligates me to play knight d3, trying to defend both of those threats. Here he invaded queen c2, and I played queen e1, guarding the back rank. Now Knappen started thinking for a while too, and played kind of a strange move. He played king f8. I guess he didn't see anything forcing. I am pretty well placed right now uh, in terms of defense. I think black is better here. My a pawn is not going anywhere, but um, defensively speaking, white has everything covered. So king f8 might just be an attempt to get the king closer for an impending endgame. You know, maybe he wants to bring the king over to try to stop the a pawn. This becomes relevant later. Uh, maybe it was just a waiting move. But it actually achieved its desired effect because I played a dubious move here. I played king to g2. There was really no reason not to check black queen b4 because they're not going to play king e8. If he plays king e8, I'll check him on b8, and uh, this is not in black's plans. So probably they're just going to go back to g7 or maybe to g8, neither of which is dangerous. I could always just play my queen back to e1. So especially being in time pressure, I think I should have just whipped off queen b4 check and not really thought twice about it. But I thought like, well, what's the rush? Let's just play king g2 and I'll get off the dangerous back rank. Why not? But then Knappen played a great move. He played queen a4. So now this pawn on a5 is taken in black sights and... If I want to play queen b4, I have to agree agree to a queen trade. And my time was ticking down, ticking down, and I didn't see anything better than that, so I just went for it. Now queen b4 check. My minor pieces are awkward. I, mean, I can't really do anything with my, my knight and my bishop. Bishop has nowhere to go. The knight sort of needs to stay on d3 to guard e5. So it's really the queen is the only thing I can play with. So maybe queen c3 was a better option. But in the end, I opted for that queen b4 check move and begrudgingly went into the end game. And I say begrudgingly because of these factors that I listed here. So black is better in this end game because uh, my a pawn is weak and they have the bishop pair. So two bishops versus a bishop and knight. That's usually an advantage for the bishop pair. And also black's king is going to prove more active. I believe this end game should be drawn, but in practice, you would always want to play black in a position like this. And black's winning plan consists of trying to round up my weak pawns, starting with that A pawn. This is the most dangerous pawn I have. If black manages the position, it's not dangerous at all. But um, they would love to eliminate this wayward pawn and then go about maybe taking that E5 pawn and potentially winning with these pawns in the center. So... 
Black played king e7. I played a6. King d7, so inching closer. Note that the bishop on e3 does a great job of holding the a7 square, so I can't advance my pawn any further. Knight c2. So I wasn't happy about my position, but you know, even when you're in positions you're unhappy with in chess, you have to play them and try to make the best of them. So I figured that my pawn on a6 is eventually going to need more protection. And my knight on b4 is not stable enough to provide that protection. It can always be chased away by black's bishop with a move like bishop c5. So I played knight c2, kicking black's bishop away. And then I played e3. And the idea is to bring the bishop back to e2 when that pawn on a6 is attacked. And also use the d4 square as kind of a blockading square. Try to get my knight up there and harass that weak pawn on e6. Because this is one weakness I can latch onto. Black doesn't have many weaknesses in their position, but that e6 pawn is a pawn that will need protection. So black played king c7, getting closer to that pawn. I played bishop e2, king b6. And this illustrates black's plan from here. So after king b6, they're looking to zigzag their light square bishop over to c8 and eventually take on a6. And if I just sit by and let that happen, I'm going to be down a pawn and I'll still have weak pawns in the center. So I played king g3. Black played bishop e8, now knight d4, attacking that pawn on e6. Bishop d7, king f4. I knew I wanted to get my king involved in some way. By playing king f4, I uh, put the idea in black's head that I might play king g5 to h6 and attack that h-pawn and maybe get a passed h-pawn myself in a best case scenario. So black plays h6, just stopping my king from advancing. And here I played knight b3. This is a good move. Um, again, if black gets a chance, they're gonna go bishop to c8 and then take my knight on d4. I'll recapture, and then they'll take on a6. Note that they wanna do it in that order because if they play bishop c8 and then take on a6, I can swap bishops and then take the pawn on e6, which will have no defenders. So like say white were just to simply wait right here, move like bishop d3, yeah, black can do this, and bishop c8 and then go take that pawn. I am going to end up in a position like the game, as we'll see this, this ending actually occurs in the game. So I played knight b3, so looking to distract black from their main goal of bishop c8 takes a6. So I'm hitting the bishop on c5, Black played bishop e7. Here I went back to d4. Black repeated. Of course, I don't really have aspirations to win this game. The result of the game is kind of in Black's hands, whether they want to agree a draw here or try to push for the win. And Knappen does the right thing. I think I would have done the same in his shoes. He decides to push for the win, so he plays bishop a3. And here, I missed a move, and I, I think he did too that would have given me at least equal chances. Um, so it's the move bishop h5. So this is a, a detail that escaped our attention, but basically I can try to sneak my bishop in behind the pawns, and in conjunction with knight d4, this pawn on e6 might prove to be weak. And if I can double attack it, that's great. Black will have no defense. So I analyze the line, king takes a6, bishop f7, uh, let's say king b6 and then knight d4 attacking the pawn. Note that if black tries to play bishop b2, looking to guard the d4 square so the knight can't get there, they would lose to knight c5 check, forking the king and the bishop. So bishop h5 is a resource that didn't even cross my mind. Uh, I might've looked at it in a similar position, but definitely not this one. And this just goes to show you like how much stuff can be missed when you're low on time. Like being low on the clock is basically like a material handicap in chess. You know, it's almost like you're playing down a pawn or two pawns or a piece even if the position's really complicated because you're just going to miss so much. That translates to worse decisions over the board. So I missed bishop h5, which probably would have guaranteed me at least a draw. Um, I played knight d4, which is actually fine for the moment. This move is okay too. Black plays bishop b2. And here, I made a big mistake. I should play knight b3. I should just move this knight away. 
because after black plays bishop c8, I can play a waiting move like bishop d3. And once again, black cannot favorably take that pawn on a6. If they go bishop takes a6, I'll swap bishops and then play knight c5 check. And then if I win e6, white is probably just winning because I'm going to say king b6, take here. This pawn's going to fall. Black's strategy has completely backfired. So I didn't realize that um, I could actually threaten knight c5 check after a swap on a6. If I had realized that, uh, I definitely would have played knight b3 after black had played bishop b2 attacking my knight. But I played bishop d3 instead. And black played also a bad move, actually. They played bishop c8. What they should do is take on d4 immediately. And in doing so, they would force me to recapture. And then they can play bishop c8 and they've sidestepped the knight b3 resource. Instead, though, black played bishop c8 immediately, a more flexible move, but this actually allows me that same defense should I find it. So I could have played knight b3, and once again, that pawn on a6 is untouchable because of the knight c5 threat. And if black goes back to a3 to cover c5, well, I'll go right back to d4. And we're just going to have this dance where my, my knight is going to go where it's needed, either d4 attacking e6 or back to b3 threatening a fork on c5 eventually. This position's a draw. Black can't strengthen their position. But after um, bishop to c8, I played h4. So I kind of figured it was inevitable that I was going to go into a same color bishop ending down a pawn. So I played h4, trying to activate one of my outside pawns. Now Knappen took on d4. I took back. He took on a6. Now here, I played my move pretty fast because I had it prepared. I'm down a pawn in the same color bishop ending. That's usually pretty bad. If you're going to be down a pawn, you want an opposite color bishop ending, not a same color bishop ending. You have more drawing chances in an opposite color bishop ending most of the time. So I kind of figured that passive defense was not going to work here. So I played bishop takes f5, sacrificing my bishop for two pawns, but gaining a lot of king activity and making the position uncertain, the outcome of the game up for grabs down the, str down the stretch. Um, I didn't have too many aspirations to win from here, but I thought maybe I could uh, gain a draw with my active king and you know my e-pawn's kind of dangerous. Um, black has to determine how they're going to defend the h-pawn if I go king g6. And just to show you why passive defense is not working here, so had I played something like king c2, I'll just flick through this line that I looked at with the computer, Basically, black's going to bring their king up, and they're eventually going to try to win this d4 pawn. And I can try to hold them off for a little while, but pretty soon I, I end up in a in a zugzwang position. Um, like here, I actually don't have that many moves with my bishop. I suppose I could play bishop b1, but I think they'll even play f4 and then maybe bishop g2 to e4 and try to enforce a trade. So... Let's say I play king e3 instead. Black's king gets into c3. Bishop here. Black might want to come back with their bishop to uh, help defend e6 should white go and attack it. And the move f4 check will be a timely resource for black, forcing white's king away from the defense of the d4 pawn. And if I lose that d4 pawn, then black has a pass pawn that they can try to promote using their king's help. And after something like this, Unfortunately, I have no way to go forward and kind of attack black's pawns. So I believe black's just going to play king c3 and march the d-pawn, and it's losing for white. So I didn't work all of that out with the limited time I had available, but I just kind of sensed that I, I can't defend this bishop ending passively. I have no counterplay. I'm kind of just, I'd be relying on a fortress type setup, uh, like putting my king on e3, trying to defend d4, but they always have that f4 check move. So that's why I went for bishop takes f5. So after e takes f5, king takes f5, Knappen played h5. This move is fine. There are other ways for black to play it, but h5 is fine. Just getting the pawn on a square where the bishop can potentially protect it. Here I played king g6, attacking the pawn. Black played bishop e2, defending. Now I got to push my e-pawn. And if I can't push the e-pawn, it's just a matter of time before black's king gets in a good position and either goes and attacks d4 or blockades this e-pawn. 
So e6 was played. And now, unexpectedly, uh, black throws away the win. So up till this point, uh, black has played the end game pretty well. But uh, with his next move, he runs the risk of allowing me to draw. So let's first look at a line that wins for black. Bishop g4 would be one way to do this, attacking the pawn. And after, say, e7, bishop here. White is in trouble because if I go and try to assist in the pawn advancing, black can just let me queen, but then go after the d-pawn. And my king is, of course, way too far away. Black's going to eat the d-pawn and run their own d-pawn. Uh, also, if instead of king f7, say I take on h5, then black can start bringing their king over. Go after the e-pawn. And white can only defend it for so long. So after a position like this, king d6, white has no good moves. They're going to have to give up uh, one of their pawns. You know, if the king moves, the king takes e7 as possible. h5, there's bishop takes h5. And it's just a matter of time before all the pawns get taken. And black wins with their d-pawn. So... Instead, I played, um, or sorry, instead he played after e6, instead of bishop to g4, he played king c7. This looks logical because black is trying to use their king to assist in stopping the pawn. Uh, however, this allows me to draw. And maybe I'll let you guys figure this out. If you want to pause your video and try to figure out how white can draw from this position, you can do so now. Okay, so the first move should be pretty obvious. It's e7. I have nothing to do other than push the pawn, so pawn e7 it is, threatening to queen. Now, if black plays king d7, that would be a huge blunder. I get king f7 in, and I'm promoting next move and winning. So on e7, black plays bishop b5. And we reach this position in the game, and here I have a choice. I can play king f7, or I can take the pawn on h5, which is now undefended. And unfortunately for me, I chose wrong. I took on h5. The correct line is king f7. And the point is that after, say, king d6, white can queen, and black will have to give up the bishop. And we reach an interesting king and two pawns versus king and two pawns ending. I saw this position in my head when I was calculating, and again, pretty low on time. I was basically under a minute. I don't know how much time I had, minute to a 30, to 30 seconds to figure it out. Um, and I assumed that after king e6, I would just be losing here. I thought that black has the opposition. Black's going to go king f5, king e4, take this pawn, and just win. However, that was a faulty assumption. White can draw by playing king f8. Point being that after king f5, there's king f7. And white kind of follows black's king. And whichever pawn black goes to, the d or the h pawn, so be it, king e4 or king g4, white will go to the opposite pawn and try to capture that. And it'll be a race, but there will be mutual queening and black will be unable to win. So for instance, if king e4, king g6, take, take, both kings are going to move out of the way and we get a race. And black does queen first, but white queens immediately thereafter. And there's no way for black to win white's queen and King and queen versus king and queen is a draw, barring some exceptional circumstances. So, uh, in fact, that move king f7, so playing e7, bishop b5, and now king f7, would draw the game, despite the superior position of black's king once the bishop is sacrificed on e8. And it's all thanks to this opposition idea, king f8, uh, and if king f5, king f7. Black could also try king f6. But in fact, here, either move would draw the game for white, king e8 or king g8. Because as soon as black king, black's king comes up to f5, white's going to step to f7. And you can see black doesn't have any other squares they can come up to. These squares are guarded by white's pawns. So it was heartbreaking to see afterwards at the computer analysis that this was a draw. <laughs> that's that's every chess player's worst nightmare, right? Like you played a game, It was this is a four-hour game, and... You put a lot of energy into it, and you blow it 
down the stretch and the computer said you could have saved the game. So it's just a real unfortunate occurrence that you kind of have to get used to sometimes, as, especially as a tournament player. It'll happen. Um, so I unfortunately played king takes h5, but despite having two pawns for the piece, uh, this is just losing for white because black is going to come over. They take the pawn on e7. I have this h pawn, but black is easily going to be able to stop that. And all black really has to do is protect their own e pawn, should my king ever go and attack it. And black will win my h pawn. Just round that up, and then they'll come and eventually win the d pawn. Yeah, they played bishop d1, forcing the pawn forward. They brought the king over, and here I just resigned. There's nothing left to play for. If something like king e5, black will play bishop f3. Let's say king f4, bishop e4. Now white has really nothing to do. Take, and black's going to go over and take this pawn eventually. They can always zugzwang white, and white will not be able to keep this sort of mini fortress forever, the king protecting the pawn. So that's how the game ended. So black won. It was a 72-move game. And um, well played by Priya Darshan. He, he, he put a lot of pressure on me this game. Even though I had a draw and uh, there were some mutual mistakes, I think he, he deserved this victory because he uh, posed me enough problems that I couldn't figure him out. And uh, the clock played a big role. He, he did an excellent job of managing his time and keeping me under pressure through this one. So several interesting moments, especially that pawn end game. It always pays to study pawn end games. And it's funny because that, uh, that drawing resource is, an, is a motif I've seen in pawn end games before. In fact, if you have a book like Doretzky's Endgame Manual, which is considered one of the greatest endgame texts ever written, he gives a lot of positions exactly like this. But with the time I had available, I, just, I couldn't figure it out. And I trusted my instincts that this was losing, and I was wrong this time. But other than uh, blowing that result, blowing that draw, I thought this was a very interesting game. Lots of attack and defense motifs. At the outset, it seemed like I had him under pressure. I was pushing on the queen side with those pawns, as you recall. There was a lot of pawn tension. Um, you know, I shifted areas of the board in attacking. I played g4, opened a second front. But um, he was able to always find a remedy for that. And I think he did a good job of managing... Um, the the shifts in the position so good game from both sides and well-deserved victory all right i'll be posting the pgn for this game on chess.com there are some lines that i didn't get to talk about in this video so check the pgn for that if you're curious and please let me know if you have any feedback thanks for watching guys bye